Say her name, say their names, Brianna Taylor. Hi, happy Thursday, welcome to the Stina Show. Um, I hope everyone's taking care of themselves. Tonight's guest is entomologist and gardener, Elizabeth Dioria. Hi everyone, welcome. Hey, hey, senior. Karen, Lizzie, Alyssa, wow, what a great crowd. All right, I'm, come on in, Liz. Hope everyone's doing good. Hey, <laughs> senior. Welcome. Am I in this? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Welcome, yeah. Liz. Thank you. You're in the inter, inter. Is this your first Instagram live? This is my first Instagram live. Yeah, I, I've never been live before, but... Um, I talk about live streaming a lot when I'm hiking and we're passing a bunch of streams and, uh, we take a moment, me and Eli, we take a moment and we're like, ah, oh, it's a nice live stream. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I should actually live stream the live stream one day. <laughs> you should bring us with you. <laughs> bring us with you, Liz. Yeah. yeah one I day. Liz's live stream. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining. I mean, yeah. I've known you for so long now. How mm -hmm. many years? 20 plus now, right? Uh, I think it's so. I mean, we're only 18, but. <laughs> <laughs> so then we've probably known each other 10 years. No, I, so I think, so you are my oldest friend. I'm <gasps> pretty sure that I, that I still like talk to and keep in touch me with too you know? me too yeah because yeah. we met in um i think it was like third going to fourth grade summer camp so. yes it was um and that was a while ago but that was summer <laughs> day camp south shore why right yeah, Represent. yeah. fond memories <laughs> um so yeah, we grew up. I, we have very <laughs> awkward pictures when we were younger that's all i know. yeah the one <laughs> The only one that we have together is the one where we're at the Mets game. <laughs> I love that one. I well, that. we have group ones from the camp, but that one's mm -hmm. the worst. It's good for us, but like for me, it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the awkward days, but uh... <laughs> but here we are, beautiful blossomed flowers. Yeah, right? I can't believe it. Look at us, adults, live streaming. <laughs> so happy is today's the international what what day of what uh international day of women and girls in science yeah. um when you booked me you probably had no idea what a topical program you'd have <laughs> <laughs> no exactly i didn't <laughs> um, that's the timing of it all right yeah yeah um yeah i think it's just like a you know international so it's global and then you know in a, in a different time there probably would have been like programs like the my university I work at has uh you know like a fun day of events that you know all people can come to and um you know just kind of there'll be scientists there and they'll show you know people you know chemistry and biology and that kind of stuff kind of nice. like a little workshop you know like a fun hands-on fun day and stuff but oh, i don't so. think it's going on this year so. not this year no yeah. maybe on zoom somewhere in the world you know there i think um i think there is one event that my department is involved with but i'm I you're know. too busy you're on a vip yeah, schedule <laughs> Uh, your sister joined. I see Alex oh, there below. Hey, sis. <laughs> uh, speaking of sister, when you were at little Lizzie, did you know you wanted to work with nature and get involved with uh, saving the planet and whatnot? Yeah, I maybe not really saving the planet, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, something that a lot of people have asked me that like, kind of sticks with me and I kind of resent is that um, people have often asked me, being from Long Island, how did you get into nature, you know? And these are mostly folks that 
um, maybe were from upstate New York, so they know more about Long Island. And, but I've also had it come from people that are from other parts of the country as, as soon as like two years ago was the last time someone from Michigan said, being from Long Island, like how'd you like get into nature and stuff? And, you know, and it's like, did, did you hear what you just said? You said Long Island. It's, <laughs> an island. it's surrounded right. by water. You can pave 100% of the island and it will still be 100% surrounded by nature. You can't put, you can't put a, a more houses in the ocean. I mean, you could build out a little bit, right? Like we do that on the barrier islands and stuff. But I think people forget that Long Island is, has nature, you know? part of the great American flyway for bird migration. We have a whole bunch of sea life. We have plants, we have animals. So um, I think mostly what has inspired me, um, I, I think I have always known I wanted to do something with animals and biology and kind of science-y um, for a long time. There was one moment, I think in sixth grade, I thought I wanted to be a movie director. What? <laughs> Yeah, I. <laughs> That's so cool. It's yeah. never too late, by the way. Yeah. The. Okay. So in so I went to Chatterton, and we did like this, uh, you know, sixth grade, um, film thing where they they put a camera outside, and then you had to walk up to the camera and say, "Hi, my name is Liz, and when I grow up, I want to be a movie director." So we have, I have this film somewhere. Oh, and I so all of this, all of the, all of the kids I went to sixth grade with, <laughs> I can still remember some of them, but I think I wanted to be a movie director in sixth grade, but um, no, I, you know, I always liked playing in the yard. Um, Did you see what your mom said, Bella? She said, no. Oh, I, hi, I, Miss Story. I guess I could see this, but is my mom here? Yeah. Hi. Did she ask a question? But, she said, um, my best friend Barbara used to call her over to look at the bugs um, in her yard. <laughs> I was just going to say that. So my, my <laughs> next door neighbor, uh, Barbara, um, may she rest in peace. She passed away recently. She, um, I mean, I, I owe a lot of my like experiences to her. She had a pool and her pool would attract large beetles and, you know, you have a pool on Long Island, you probably know this and you probably hate this, but um, she would take them out of the filter, sometimes dead, sometimes alive, and she'd save them for me, um, especially the live ones. And she'd bring them to me and they'd be these big, um, big black beetles. Um, I, don't I don't know what they are from like back then, but I'm pretty sure they're darkling beetles or tenebrand beetles. And um, so yeah, she should save them for me. And, you know, I, I remember that, the, you know, fondly. Uh, I remember my brother pouring salt on a slug outside oh, no. and, you know, <laughs> and pouring water on it and that kind of thing. And then um, uh, my, you know, other experiences that I had that were like out in nature was at, you know, at my grandfather's house on Shelter Island, um, you know, he had like I had actually a lot of different places I can go to. Both my grandparents had, had places there, still have places there, but um, you know, there was forest and there, they were, there's the beach and I, you know, pick up crabs. And um, my grandfather at one point had a, like a, kind of like a groundskeeper, this, this guy who was a groundskeeper and, and his wife also worked on the property. And he um, caught me butterflies. I must have been six. He caught Aww. me a bunch of butterflies, um, and he and he pinned them to a piece of cardboard. And um, like in my recollection, I remember being scared because I thought they were still alive. And I think the wind came, and like the wings of the butterflies kind of fluttered. And I think I thought they were still alive, and I hid under this large table. Um, at my grandfather's house because I was scared of them. But I'm pretty sure these are the experiences that, <laughs> like, like I can go on and on all day. Like, I remember, yeah. I remember uh, the, the moment I said, I 
think I want to be an entomologist. And that was um, not until I was in like ninth grade. Um, wow. Before that, I wanted to be like a zookeeper or something. Like I got over the movie director thing. And I think I thought I wanted to be like a zookeeper or something. But um, I was watching the Christina Aguilera documentary on VH1. Like, you know, one of those where it's like, where did they start from? And Christina Aguilera, there's like this, like, <laughs> image or like video of Christina Aguilera playing a guitar and singing when she was like three. And I'm like, I wonder what I've been doing since I was three. Like what? It's like, I guess I like bugs. And that that was like it. <laughs> wow. But you had all the a lot of signs telling you that that you can remember. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Not not many people could remember those, those details. Yeah, I mean, everyone is like, you know, I, I might have a different path ahead of me later on. I'm not saying like, this is like, movie direct. What I'm going to, you know, like, <laughs> again, like I, I'm, you know, at this moment in time, I am reflecting on what I want to do in the future. And um, yeah, some people know what they want to do when they're young and some people don't. Um, plenty of my friends and colleagues that are, you know, that I work with or have worked with or like went to grad school with, some of them kind of like fell into it like oh they had a previous career as an artist and then i don't like they got a a job working with a company that did something with bugs and they were like i think i like bugs now or something like that or or i think i like science you know not everyone who um not everyone who like um there are entomologists that are like really, really into bugs, and, like love bugs, love collecting bugs. And then there are those that are like really into science and love science and love the process of science. And they happen to be in entomology because insects are really good like model organism for what they want to study. So that's kind of like, you can have those kinds of careers or whatever, but yeah. Uh, Tara Gibson said, direct a movie about bugs. Oh, hey Tara. <laughs> up uh that's a great idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true yeah. combine the two never give up right mm -hmm. never. yeah cool never. so then you decided in ninth grade and mm -hmm. then you went on and you're like i have to apply to colleges so mm -hmm. which colleges have bugs there mm -hmm. i you know like i said like ninth grade i was like yeah i like bugs and i maybe i'll be an entomologist um and through high school I don't even think I was thinking of a career in high school. I I don't, I mean, I think I always wanted to be in science or biology or like go to college for biology, but I don't even know what I was thinking. But then when it came time for me to go to college, I went to Nassau Community College first. I and that. I was in like the liberal arts and sciences with like the science honors major or whatever. Uh and, uh, I took like environmental science classes. And so I kind of um, came to the realization that like I, I Googled like, what what is it that I wanna be? What do I wanna do? And it was actually conservation biology. Cause I really liked thinking like, I wanna save endangered species, you know, like I wanna study endangered species. So that's what conservation biology is. So, um, so that's what I went to college for when I transferred to ESF. Um, I only applied to one school and I got in. So nice. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> good um, grades. Good grades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, you know, there, I, I knew I wanted to go to California. I really wanted to go to California, but my mom told me no. And <laughs> so, Oh, she's like, no. So I'm, I'm actually really happy that I um, went to the college I went to. And then, um, yeah, I think it opened up a lot of, a lot of opportunities for me. And like, I, um, you know, I'm still doing, and I'm still interested in conservation biology and entomology. Like I'm, you know, I'm interested in uh, conserving endangered insects, you know, like that's something I'm really passionate about. So um, that's kind of where those two intersect kind of, but. 
Alex said, save the pangolins. Save the pangolins, yes. <laughs> Very specific. <I> <laughs> so, yeah. so why do you, uh, we, I, I'm sure a lot of us watching don't know, why are bugs so important? Oh my God, how are they it's not? <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, the passion just shines through. Right? I love they, it. They, they are our biggest rival in this world. I mean, they are our number one enemy. And also our best friend, you know? We rely on them for a lot of the processes in our ecosystems and in the world to, you know, help us. That's, I'm thinking food. Usually people think pollination and food and that kind of thing. Um, you know, and that for people don't think like dung beetles and how dung beetles are the, you know, the insects that move around poop, but if they didn't, then we would just be up to our knees and poop. and. <laughs> Poop is full of, you know, uh, bacteria that can get into our food and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but also, we are always struggling to battle them for a resource, and that's also food. Um, but also, like, clothing. Like, they, you know, cotton is a plant, and, you know, we, if it's not organic cotton, then it's you know, conventionally grown cotton and bugs are eating our cotton and, you know, we have to manage that and fight for the cotton because we want it, we want to wear it, you know, that kind of thing. So they really um, are everywhere, you know, and they're really important. You know, people don't realize just like little things that happen um, that, or like that they hear of that like that insects are involved in. There's this one thing. Like one of the vaccines currently that um, I think it is, I, I think it's Novavax. Um, it's not currently being, like, I don't think it has been approved yet, but Novavax vaccine uses moth cells to create the protein. You know, they, they do something to the moth cells and then it makes the spike proteins that are then um, you know, injected into our bodies that help our immune response. Moths are used for that, you know, like people don't think about insects in our, you know, in the news and in our everyday life and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, and there are studies that have come out recently that insects are in decline. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that, um, you know, one of the popular um, kind of visuals is the the windshield um like the windshield the car windshield study or whatever how you know we're seeing you know on road trips when we were younger you know we would the the windshield on the car would always get inundated with bugs and now fewer bugs are being seen on windshields you know like that's kind of uh well maybe they're getting smarter <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> you know what I, I don't know if anyone's tested that <laughs> Like, F these guys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, evolution exists probably within all of us, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what about, like, bees and stuff? That I know they're important, right? Yeah, I, bees are very important. I think that, um, you know, if, you know, in the couple minutes of my time to discuss bees, what I could say, what I, what I always like to reiterate is that the, not, the only bees are not just honey bees. A lot of people think that, you know, save the bees, save the honey bees. Um, but I think that a lot of people are surprised to find out that honey bees, A, are non-native. They came here from Europe. Um, and so they're not a native, a, a native bee. So, you know, save the bees. It's, it's interesting because they're, they're not native. Um, <laughs> Also, they are managed, which and they are kept by people. Um, honeybees live in those boxes, those honeybee hives. And so they're kind of like cows. They're kind of like- I was like just gonna cows. say that, yeah. They're yeah. kind of like um, they're, right. chickens. 
you know? They're worker, worker. They work, yeah. yeah, they are livestock that just has wings and can move beyond oh, their own pasture, you know? No, so, that's so sad. <laughs> yeah. That's why so, vegan, that's why raw vegans don't eat honey then, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because, you know, um, it's an animal byproduct. So, um, yeah, I mean, one could argue that almond milk is not vegan. This is getting on a tangent, but I do bees. Like, almond milk. I drink almond breeze. Um, it says <laughs> vegan on it. But the thing is, almonds and the way they grow, they can't grow without honeybees. The way that we demand them right now. Most of our almonds that we get are grown in California, and the uh, almonds are tree are trees, and they bloom beautiful flowers, and they start to bloom in February. Now there are no bees in February that are in enough numbers in those regions of California where the bees are. I mean, where the almonds are growing, so bees get shipped from Florida. So people in Florida, beekeepers in Florida have thousands, you know, of hives or whatever. And they get shipped on an 18 wheeler all the way to a field in, you know, northern central California and let go. And like, you know, they open the box and the bees like, how did I get here? You know, and, and then they and then they visit the flowers and they pollinate the flowers and then we get almonds. Um, but it, you know, my question is- It could is, mess up, it could mess up like uh, natural states, right? I mean, you know, then um, this is one of, mm. you know, one of the potential reasons that we are seeing these like colony collapses. You know, if you've heard of colony collapse disorder, that's for honeybees. One of the reasons for that is that, you know, the bees are only, they're, you know, they are under stress when they are shipped. And then mm. they go to this one orchard and they only have very limited resources. You know, they're not eating a, a, a very diverse diet. Um, you know, if you only eat one thing, like, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't survive. <laughs> I, yeah, mean, I mean, I would take a long time, but I wouldn't survive. So this is like, I, this is something actually Eli and I were talking about. So this isn't like something that other people, so, but maybe other people have come up with it. But like, yeah, you could argue that almond milk isn't vegan because of the intense lives <laughs> that the bees go oh. through. And once they leave the almond orchards, they go to the apple orchards in Washington. They go to the blueberry orchards, orchards in Michigan. They get shipped around the country. You, so saw, uh, are, you see what you see Alyssa said something regarding this never thought about that with almonds couldn't that also be said of most pollinated plants then that could be said for the industries that yes that could be said for the big industries that they have that we have in the US that need uh, migratory bee migratory honeybee pollinators so like apples and blueberries so not everything you know not everything has i mean we don't um ship honeybees for every crop there's just like certain types of crops that uh you know they we need like the supplemental uh increase in pollination so we have to ship in the bees um mm. but the whole point like 10 minutes ago what i wanted to say was like <laughs> we can't forget about our wild bees we have wild native bees. Like I said, honeybees, they're, you know, they're not native, you know, invasive even, but, but they're really important and they're a big industry here and around the world. But what we have also are, are wild bees that are also pollinating our plants and our food crops and something that, um, you know, there's a lot of research going on about. Um, something that Eli's worked on is that uh, how to, increase the likelihood that wild bees will come into your will come into your farm you know and how to uh, plant other like prairie type plants or other pollinator attracting plants um, around your garden to to lure them in and that kind of thing so we do have um, yeah 
wild bees as well, and other pollinators. Not, there are flies that pollinate, right, you know, right. wasps pollinate. Obviously, you know, everyone knows about uh, um, like butterflies pollinate and moths, birds. So, yeah. But bees are just most well known. Mm hmm Yeah. Alyssa, really she said, so, Alyssa said, so then are free range almonds, apples acceptable or no? <laughs> free like, range like, almonds are the free ranging almonds like around. Are they rolling around <laughs> down I, the hill? I prefer my cage free almonds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and this is like you can I you know these are just like the bit. This is like almond breeze. There's probably smaller smaller companies, you know, that are less reliant on you know they're, they're smaller companies so they could they have a little bit more freedom to um you know manage their orchards right. other ways i guess so then this goes kind of we're gonna we're gonna bounce around but this goes yeah. kind of into your sustainable living because if we <laughs> just grew it all ourselves we wouldn't have to deal with s slaved bees essentially and, yeah. and all these things yeah i mean the the yeah, the, the problem is like, we're, we're not all, we're all busy. Like who, you know, <laughs> if, if we all, if we all had our own gardens, then we wouldn't have time to, you know, do other things in our lives or make money or whatever. Right. So like, um, yeah, what I'm currently, I, you know, I, yeah, if we wanna talk about garden, I've really grown to love gardening for a couple of reasons. Once it, it is like, yeah, I guess it's like part of my sustainable living. I've also, I've been trying to, you know, limit how much trash and, um, you know, you can limit your trash by stop, by like, you know, reducing what you get at the grocery store, you know, and, you know, eating things that don't have plastic on them or that kind of thing. And then um, it also, what gardening has allowed me to do is to compost. So I don't have a yard. Um, I have a house, but it doesn't have a backyard and it's, I'm renting and um, my landlord is really cool. Uh, it's like this like older hippie guy, but like we've chatted about like we could plant in the front yard, but then like it's right by a main street and we just get like fumes or whatever. And like, you know, from the cars. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I love gardening because it, yeah, it helps like reduce what I need to get at the grocery store. It also, it's just like a hobby that, you know, you go there and, you know, I don't even listen to music when I'm there. Just kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a way to like break away from technology and uh, weeding is kind of therapeutic and um, yeah, I don't know. What was the question? Uh <laughs> Well, I know, well, it's going to, there's gonna be a lot of questions, but uh, I know my friends have those things you put in your house, like those, those grow kits or something. I don't know what they are. Yeah. Yeah. So are you, are you, are you, are you into those kinds of things? No, I don't have, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that I'm not into it, but, um, so. And they're I, expensive, I think, but I don't know. Yeah. I've heard of those. It's kind of like this big and maybe there's some grow lights and then yeah, exactly um, exactly and then there's like these pods that you kind of place um it's a little bit limiting you know for i mean i grew 49 tomato plants you fit like four plants and you know it's like eh, it's not enough. like i planted a lot you know me and eli together i say i but like man but <laughs> anyway so yeah. um but Th those are really cool and I think those are really um I think those are great for beginner gardeners because there's like with anything there's like a, a learning curve and also like kind of like a, an activation energy to get started that sometimes you're just like you know with everything in life you're like I know I want to do this but how do I get started so I think those are probably really good for people that have never gardened before and um, want something that's nearby because, um, you know, if it's in your site, it's in, you know, 
out of sight, out of mind, you know, but if it's there, you can take care of it. Um, but yeah, I don't have one of those, but those are really cool. I do think they're probably a little bit expensive, but I don't know. Um, well, I mean, it's still, still probably better than mm -hmm. trusting another brand or who knows yeah. if a farmer that we don't know or. Yeah, you had asked me, um, you're like, I'm curious how you garden in the snow. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for and, reminding me. Yeah, you know, to clarify, I'm currently not gardening. We have two, so last summer we had two spots. We had this um, this plot of land we, we rented from the county. So our county is in charge of the contracts for like these vacant lots between houses. You know, I guess if like a house is torn down or something, there's like a free free piece of land. So they hold those contracts and they rent out to gardeners as a way to kind of um, put the burden of like upkeep. Otherwise they'd have to mow that lawn. Um, it's like, yeah, they'd have to mow it. So it's like, oh, well, let's just rent it out to people that to garden on it so we can get it off. Cool. So, I, that's what I had that plot of land. And then I also um, have, a, have a spot in a community garden, um, which I, I help, I'm a garden leader at the community garden with these two other wonderful- Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so Someone so said, uh, Kelly Riegler said, um, Liz told me how to start gardening. 1010 would recommend. <laughs> oh, I love Kelly, yes. <laughs> uh, See, you can garden anywhere. Kelly and I had our garden in containers, just pots, in our, like, backyard. It was like a parking lot. Like, we had our, and we grew, my my favorite thing I grew that year was the broccoli, but she grew these tomatoes, and we grew basil. But, yeah, you can have a garden anywhere. You have a little bit of space and some sunlight and access to water. Um but yeah, it was fun. Um, what was I saying though? Oh, I had a spot in the community garden. <laughs> Do you know what a community garden is? No, what is a community garden? Okay, because some people don't know, you know, so. Yeah, fun. of course, right. I mean, uh, I don't. Right, I mean, I didn't want to I mean, assume you did, but I also didn't want to assume you did. Just it. assume I know nothing <laughs> <laughs> and go from there. Um, a community garden, I'm sure, has, you know, is different in different places with how it's managed or funded or whatever. But um, here, a community garden is a place where people can rent uh, a size of land. So um, it, the, the size is usually standard, like a 20 foot by 20 foot piece of land. And then you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and it's, you know, it's in a community garden, so it's, you know, other people have gardened there for years before, and so, um, you know, there's people growing all, all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, you, you rent, you rent the plot of land. Uh, this one's on like a sliding scale, um, like pay scale or whatever, so I think we paid like 15 bucks or whatever. But like, you could pay nothing, you can pay yeah more as like a donation um but what it does is it empowers people in the community to grow their own food it's for like food security it's they they don't own we don't only just rent the land but um there's also other programs with the community garden that gives free plants to people um, wow. so you know I, I live in a city so you know there's varying you know degrees of wealth so there's like low income, you know, folks that might um, not even know that they can grow their own food. You know, they're relying on go to the grocery store. So our community garden is like a network and um, kind of built into like the food bank kind of structure. That's awesome. Yeah. Because I know a lot of complaints from like the average Joe, well, you know, mm -hmm. my family members, etc., are like, it's expensive. These things mm -hmm. are expensive, but no. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are alternatives if you just mm -hmm. if you want something bad enough, if you want to feel good, you can find these solutions. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I will say I, oh, my cat, hey, go away. Um, <laughs> no. 
Yeah. Bring it on. Um, <laughs> you told me to bring props or pictures or something. I brought this um, dragonfly. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, cool. Really into like cruelty free, um, like an artwork, that kind of stuff. Um, go wait. No, bring her on. <laughs> Uh, uh, I well, I, okay. say, I will I will say like I I haven't spent too much time on Long Island looking for community gardens, but I don't even know if they're that like common. Brooklyn has them, I know. I don't know about yeah. Long Island. Right. So uh, what like, What about the snow? I think we missed the. Uh, oh yeah, the, I didn't talk the about snow. That. I have to go on tangents. Okay. Show us the cat. They said. <laughs> Yay, Mary Cats said so is the kid. Come on. Oh my gosh, how cute, please. Okay. <laughs> wow, there's okay. 10 people here? Wow. On our, Alina, on our. Alina's here. Alina, look, I'm using this cup. <laughs> Me and Alina got this cup together, and I think of her every time I drink out of it. We got it at the Portland Farmers Market or whatever. Oh, wow. Come here. She's coming, I think. Um, okay, Alyssa so said, <laughs> "All right, so the snow. All right, so I'm not currently yeah. gardening in the snow, but you can. You, they, we, um, we currently have carrots in the ground. So, like, if it were to thaw, we could get our carrots out. We left carrots in the ground, so they're not growing. They're probably just kind of chilling. But um, we do have some carrots. Uh, last year." What uh, we did was we built these um, boxes with a window top and a hinge, and we grew um, more hardy vegetable, like hardy greens, like kale and lettuce and carrots in those. Um, and we had those like all the way through um, like Christmas last year where wow. we were able to like pick greens around Christmas time. So it was like, cool. it's kind of like a mini greenhouse. Oh, here she is. Come here. Yeah. Come here. She left. <laughs> oh, wait. She'll you know, be back. <laughs> oh, look what I just found. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is this a Temptations sponsorship? <laughs> They love it, I know. Oh, Karen says hi, too. Karen! She's, Karen said, on our block club, b banded together and built a raised bed community garden and volunteers can upkeep. You don't need to purchase land, just takes the will to do it. Oh, uh, hello. On Karen's <laughs> block? I guess so, yeah. Oh, cool. Look at the baby. She's so cute. Oh, my Thank gosh. You. Hi, baby girl. Hi. <laughs> She's like, what's up, ma? What's up, ma? <laughs> Did she get her temptation? I, it's, I, I think oh, she that is. was Alyssa said that. I don't know who's on a, Alyssa's account anymore. Karen and Alyssa. <laughs> well, they're sharing the account, and that's Alyssa's block, I guess. Oh, that's funny. Okay, cool. I was so, going to say, hey, that's cool. Um, yeah, so, so, um, yeah, so you can go in the winter time, especially if you have a greenhouse and there's some supplemental lighting and it's warm. Um, but I don't have that. <laughs> so, t Tara said, what, what is your favorite bug and why? Oh. Uh, all right. I Here I know, go. but I like the bug. I go, I researched it after. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. So my favorite <laughs> bug is the American burying beetle, and um, it's awesome. So the American burying beetle, uh, Nicrophorus americanus, is its scientific name. It's a native beetle to the U.S. It's also the on the endangered species list. So it's a federally listed endangered species. Not many insects are federally listed. There's a lot of like butterflies and stuff that are, but uh, the American burying, because it buries things, beetle, um, it's a carrion beetle. And it's cool because not only is it endangered, and I, I you know, I'd like to let people know about this cool beetle, so they, 
are aware that he's protecting, I guess, but um, it, um, it exhibits biparental care, which I think is really cool. Uh, biparental care is when both parents take care of their young, which is not common in insects. You know, it's not common in a lot of different animals where both parents will invest in parental care. So mm -hmm. um, what happens is um, a, a female or a male beetle will be walking uh, on the forest floor and come, or come across a dead small animal. Uh, a deceased animal, rest in peace, uh, either a bird or a mouse or like a chipmunk or something like that, something small. And um, so they'll stand on top of it and then they'll send out their pheromones to attract a mate. And, oh, this is also perfect for Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> so they'll, they'll stand on top of the dead uh, rodent or whatever and it, and call out to a mate with its pheromones coming out of its antenna and um, the mate will and so uh, you know probably more than one but you know hopefully it'll, it'll attract a mate and then they bury the dead animal together um, and they bury the animals so that it um, it like dissuades scavengers you know because deceased animal smell. So uh, they, you know, buried under the ground um, so that, you know, live birds and vultures and crows or whatever can't get to it. And then they mate. I'm not sure if they mate on top of the ground or under the ground. I'm not really sure that I can't remember, but they mate. And uh, the female lays eggs under the ground next to the dead animal. And um, this is also really cool. Uh, they hatch, <laughs> and um, after they hatch, the um, the parents will um, kind of like a bird uh, chew on chew on some pieces of meat off and uh, feed it to their young. So, uh, you know, so it, this has to happen very quickly for them to feed it to their babies. Well, um, no. Well, it doesn't, I mean, it, I, I don't know. I mean, it probably could be mm. a week or two or something like that. Mm. Um, but, um, oh, the other thing is that as one parent is um, feeding the young larvae, the other is um, on, the, on the ground, um, a, a, you know, above the carcass or whatever, on the ground, um, making sure no one else is going to come and bother them. Wow. So, yeah, it's cool, right? What a love story. Baker said um, how romantic. Yeah, it really is. So um, <laughs> there are other species of burying beetles in the world. Um, this one is the largest. Uh, they're Halloween colored, so they're black. And then they have orange spots on their uh, on their pronotum and then just kind of like their shoulders and then their, their back. Um, so yeah, they're really cool. And, you know, some, this is like another thing that people don't real like another animal or another example of an insect that is impacted by people um, that, that folks don't realize. Um, but like the Keystone Pipeline, um, the, you know, there was an environmental assessment, obviously, there's always an environmental assessment when like big infrastructure and equipment needs to go through on land and you know the American burying beetle and the the impact that the Keystone pipeline would have to the American burying beetle is in the environmental assessment and yeah it the Keystone pipeline is you know would be you know trajected right in the middle of their habitat they're very dwindling tiny habitat you know so um that's a that's a concern um, There's a lot of concerns with this damn pipeline. But let's pray. <laughs> I, let's pray for the burying I, beetle. That, show. Well, that's what I mean. Like there's, yeah. there's people. Like there's so many aspects, and this is just one. Oh, it's just another thing. <laughs> you know? um, well, so then, if I guess if the if the beetle, what mm -hmm. if another animal gets to the, the dead carcass before the beetle? You know, yeah, that's well, just what happens. Yeah, it's just what happens. You know, that's that's um, uh, survival. That's survival of the fittest, I guess. It's competition, in, you know. And the beetle's like, 
mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't find my mate now. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes there are um, like other bearing beetles will come too. So they'll fight, you know, or deter other beetles, not just other animals, but. Um, uh, Karen said, Lizzie, the beetle's so specific. I'm now questioning evolution. And Mary Cat said, <laughs> uh, "Mary Cat said, are they all over or just limited to a specific area?" Oh, okay. So they are. Good question, Alina. Um, there are very few populations. Um, one of the population, the larger one, is kind of like Nebraska, Kansas area. Um, okay, so they used to be all over, like all over the eastern U.S. towards the middle of the country. So I think all of the east, I guess. Um, but they, like, more than 90% of their habitat is gone. Um, there is a um, another population in Rhode Island, um, actually on Block Island, which I think is part of Rhode Island. Um, so Block Island, randomly. There's also a population on Block Island. Um, and yeah, and there's, there's people, there's an entomologist researching why they're disappearing and how to establish new habitat. And, um, one thing is that, and it's, I know I've mentioned this to you, I think this is really cool, but one of the, um, hypotheses, I think it's a working hypothesis about why the American bearing beetle um, has been dwindling and has declined and why it lost 90% of its population might be um, due to the passenger pigeon um, going extinct. So there was this passenger pigeon, a species of bird that uh, we shot into extinction. Uh, There used to be a lot of them. And so they um, think that the passenger pigeon was the perfect size host food for the American bearing beetle. And so um, because it doesn't have, you know, when they went extinct, the beetles now had to, you know, get smaller food, you know, if you have a smaller food or a smaller amount of food, you know, you don't, your chances of survival are now limited. So um, I don't think that's proven, but it's like a working hypothesis. <laughs> oh. um, so what is this regrow milkweed for monarchs project? Oh, my plug. This is my, all right. This, this is, is your plug. plug. Where I plug <laughs> something. So uh, last year, um, me and my boss and this other entomologist that I work with in my lab, um, we launched this community science program. Uh, Community science is also known as citizen science and it's where you get like normal people, like non-scientists all over the world to, to help you observe something or collect data. So, um, we launched one for monarch butterflies. We're running out of time for me to get too in depth with monarch butterflies and why they're really awesome and important and we need to conserve them. But um, I'll probably still get into some of those details. But yeah, yeah. We, we launched this with this program. It's called Regrow Milkweed for Monarchs. Uh, milkweed is a is the host plant of monarchs so their caterpillars eat milkweed um and they only eat milkweed so in the u.s we have dwindling milkweed numbers so because we have dwindling milkweed numbers we have fewer monarchs so um through experimentation we have um in my lab um shown evidence that you can increase your monarch population um, if you increase their um, their egg laying, and we have increased their egg laying by um, cutting milkweed at a certain point in time over the summer. So milkweed grows all summer, um, 
and after it grows, it senesces, it sends out seeds and it senesces, and it's not very attractive for monarchs um, to lay eggs on because it's chewy. They can't, it's not tender. They like the tender meat, and at some point, the milkweed is not good to eat anymore. So we found that if you cut the milkweed so it starts to regrow, that's where the regrow comes from. If you cut the milkweed plant at a certain stage in the summer, it'll send out new shoots. And the new shoots are the yummy shoots. And those mm -hmm. are the ones that will attract more monarchs because they are um, a preferred food. Um, they can, they can um, get into the, the, they can eat the leaves easier um, when they are tender like that. So. Um, we have this program where we've said, all right, people like go into your gardens and in mid July, you know, cut your milkweed and let it regrow and then observe whether it attracts more monarchs to it. And so, um, yeah, a lot of people participated last year and we're probably going to redo it again this year. Um, uh, you know, it, why are monarchs so important? Yes, I knew so. <laughs> um, <laughs> monarchs are, you know, they're just as, in, as important as all insects, but specifically, um, they're, they're, they are declining in numbers. Um, the monarchs that we're interested in are the monarchs that fly to Mexico over the winter. So, man, these are cool. Like most people think of migration as like birds. I mean, people probably don't even think of whales, but whales migrate. Um, so do butterflies. And so monarchs migrate to Mexico every year. And what's really cool is that they all go to the same place. It's not like they all go, you know, some go to Cancun and some go to Mexico City and some go to of uh, Ixtapa and whatever. They all go to the same little tiny forest, and no matter if they were in Massachusetts or Maine or Michigan or Texas. They all go to the same forest. So monarchs that you see are actually one population. Um, so we only have one population of monarchs. And if we lose that population, we have zero population. So they are in decline. Um, and so every year they fly down to Mexico and, um, you know, they, they live out the winter there and then they fly back up to the Eastern United States and they mate and lay eggs on the way. And, um, during the summer they lay eggs and then those eggs grow up to be adult butterflies and they mate and they lay eggs. And what's cool and like a mystery, is that three generations pass in the summer before that third um, generation goes down to Mexico. So this is like saying my great great grandmother came, t came here from Mexico. I never met my great great grandmother, but I'm now gonna go fly to her home where she spent the winter time. How do they know? <laughs> you know it's, it's Ancestry.com <laughs> for butterfly, for monarch. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's what's really cool about monarchs. And, you know, a, a lot of different animals do that. They, you know, travel to a place they've never been, but somehow know that, like, something is calling them there. You wow, know? that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's so, deeper. They have. They yeah. have lives of their own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, that's cool. it's really cool. So that's why, so, you know, if we, the forest in Mexico where they live, you know, if they, if that forest um, undergoes like a, a hurricane, which it has, or high winds, you know, that could be really devastating. So we have to try and improve every stage of their life you know, from, you know, down to Mexico to milkweed, you know, here in the U.S., you know, increased milkweed. Um, and milkweed is really found mostly in 
agriculture. Like monarchs are mostly in agricultural landscapes because that's where the milkweed grows. Um, but then of course we have um, pesticides. Farmers don't mm. want milkweed competing with their soybean or their corn. So um, uh, that's why we don't have milkweed because it's, it's, it's that, eradicated it's a, or whatever. So weed, right? Yeah. Sorry, my, my phone. Is, but um, all right, we have a few minutes. Quick, deep okay. quote and or enlightenment experience to share. Okay, I I brought a I brought a book with a poem. I'm gonna read oh, this wonderful. poem. It's short. That's yeah. fine. I, yeah, this <laughs> it's is a ten minute um, poem. <laughs> right, it's Mary Oliver. A lot of people have heard of her, but um, and a lot of people have heard this uh this poem, but I think it. I mean, it kind of like. It's everything we've been talking about. So it's called The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she shifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild, precious life? The end. Woo, that's too true, too real, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> too real. Yola. That's nice. Yola, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Liz will be rolling down the hill with the almonds. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's yeah. beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, no problem. Thanks. Where did you find that? Um, I I have this book. Um, I bought this book kind of recently. I don't know. Like she she passed away, and I think I bought this after she passed away, like a year ago. Um, but I've always liked poetry, and I've always liked her poems. I've never, I don't really buy poetry books very often. Um, but yeah, you know, she just, you know, wrote about naturey things. She speaks to you. That's awesome. Yeah. Your mama says Oktoberfest. <laughs> Oktoberfest it? I don't know what that means. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming, Liz. I, I really, <laughs> it was, thank you, Ms. <laughs> but thank you, Liz. Do you have anything to say to your fans in the comments and uh, no, viewers? Thank no, thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> your <of> mom. <laughs> she said, I meant love it. Not sure where Oktoberfest came from. <laughs> it's very, that's very my mom to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone that came. It's so nice. Yeah, I'm just. We like, had a lot of people coming. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. We had a little uh, a middle elementary reunion here. Yeah. And, uh, and I really would love to bring you on again to talk about sustainable living because I know that's a whole other hour, right? Yeah, I know, right? Well, I can go on. <laughs> On and on all day. So. Well, I'll bring you back in, you know, in a in a, a certain amount of time. You'll come back if you want to. <laughs> if you want to, you know. Always, obviously. always. We should do a, a a few of us on here, a panel. <laughs> we should. We should. What is that bird noise? Oh, uh, it's my clock. <laughs> That's your timer. Time's up. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank Thanks you, Liz. Christina. I love you, I love so, you much. so much. I love you so much. <laughs> thank you. Save the planet, Lizzie. Too. <laughs> you too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Ah, is Liz the best? Liz is the best, right? I know. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I appreciate you. Liz appreciates you. I know. 
Um, Casey just missed Liz. She just left. Uh, this will be live, posted YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, and here, Instagram Live. Thank you guys for joining. I uh, forget who the next week's guest is, but come next Thursday, every Thursday. Uh, take care of yourself. Deep breaths. Stay warm, if you're in New York, at least. Much love.